And uh, Wilkinson, I'm going to talk about inferring generic types uh, for collections and other kind of generic classes uh, using live typing. As you know, live typing is a technique uh, that we implemented on Quiz that collects type information while the system is running. We made a modification to the VM and also to the tools of Smalltalk of Quiz to take advantage of that type information, like when doing refactorings, when looking for senders and implementers. Uh, live typing has some limitations. Uh, for example, it doesn't work uh, for blocks or closures. It doesn't collect the type, the types of the, the parameters and the variables defined inside a block. And also has the thing, you know, with generic types. Uh, and what do I mean by generic types? <clears throat> So if we go to, uh, for example, this, I have an implementation of a tic-tac-toe, and a tic-tac-toe has an state, and if you put the mouse over there, you can see the types for that variable. In this case, uh, the types could be plain X, plain O, blah, blah, blah. All of them uh, have a superclass that it, it is tic-tac-toe state. Uh, but if you put the mouse over here, you will see that it's an order collection, but an order collection of what? That's the missing part. And if you come here, uh, for example, and you say uh, player O position first, you would like to see the type of the object that are inside that collection or in that collection. But if you come here, there is not really any good type information because uh, you know it could be anything. The, the first uh, returns any kind of uh, object because it's a generic implementation so that's the limitation we have we currently have with uh live typing uh how do statically type languages solve this problem uh, for those that you don't know this is java it's, it's a new language programming language. yeah it's cool uh, so anyway the, the, the way you, uh, this is a simple example, uh, you can define that card is a card of T, T is the generic type, yeah, and you can use that uh, type on different places, like for example here saying that uh, the items are going to be a list of T, uh, the add message is going to receive an item that is going to be a, of type T, and that T could be anything, for example here could be a string, it could be a number, it could be a product or a card or whatever you want. And the nice thing about this is that, for example, if you get one element from, from the collection, here anyone returns an optional of that T, get returns the element that the optional references to, and it is interesting because you can see that it's a string and the autocompletion works as a string. That is the receiver or a string. Um, <clears throat> so that's usually how uh, statically type languages use generic types. Um, notice that you have to define the type, and you are the one uh, responsible of defining where that type is used and so on. Um, cool. So last year, uh, two years ago, we, we studied a research thesis by Mariano and Anita that they uh, defended it last year, and it was this, the first uh, attempt to add generic types to live typing. It was an idea where we modified the VM also, uh, but it only worked for order collection. It wasn't a, a, a solution that could scale to other kind of uh, classes or genetics. But the good thing about what they did is that it showed us the way. Uh, it showed some issues that we would have and they solved it like type aliasing, printing the types and so on. And, and the most important one is that it gave us the idea, a new idea, that was why don't we use type inference to infer the generic types based on the information that live typing has. Uh, so that's well, the uh, work that uh, Adrian Castiglioni did, and he uh, presented the thesis this year. He's not in jail, okay? It's just the picture he sent me. Uh, and 
you know, the idea is that we use type inference. What's type inference? Type inference refers to automatic detection of the type of an expression in a formal language. Thank you, Wikipedia. <laughs> Uh, so, just a quick example of how uh, type inference could work. So, let's say we have a variable, we are in a small talk, and we are assigning one to that variable. So, this is the simplest case. You can say that A is of type small integer, okay, because you already know that you're assigning an integer to it. But what happened in this case? In this case, if you want to know the type of A, so let's forget about this now. And if you want to know the type of A, you have to look for the return type of factorial. So you have to look for all the implementations of factorial, in this case it's one, and try to infer the return type of factorial. But what happens if you have this? Then you have to look for all the implementations of plus, and reduce that number of uh, possible implementations at 23, to the ones that are valid when the receiver is B, but then you have to infer the type of B. And, you know, how do you infer the type of B? Well, and also you have to infer the type of C because maybe, uh, I don't know, it will do something different depending on uh, the, what the plus does or the cross does. So, as you can see, it is a recursive algorithm that you have to go inside and look for implementer, implementers and senders and so on. And, of course, it has some problems like this one, where you uh, want to deduce the type of A sending this message that receives A and returns A. So what's the type of that? <laughs> cool. So that's how type inference work. Quick intro to type inference. Uh, just to, a little bit of history. It's an old idea. Uh, we, can, we have some papers from the 1980s. Or this one, 1981, from Suzuki, that work, talks about inferring types in small talk. So this idea of inferring types in small talk is as old as small talk. Uh, and, and an interesting thing about this, uh, uh, you cannot read that there, but uh, as a conclusion, uh, Suzuki says that Al Perlis suggests him that they could run the system against some examples and record all type arguments and the results. And, you know, that's what live typing does. <laughs> okay. So, Al Berlis had the idea uh, 19, before 1981. And he also mentions the thesis of Mike, Michael, uh, Mitchell, sorry. That's a 1970 thesis, okay, that, uh, you know, this guy Mitchell talks about type inference. And, of course, we know that ML, the first, uh, I think, programming languages that implemented type inference is around the 70s. 74 or 72, I don't remember exactly. So it's an old idea. In, it has some pros and cons. The pros are no need to explicitly type everything. You know, the system will deduce this, the types for, from, from you, for you. The cons is that they're not perfect, it's slow, it's a recursive algorithm, so it's, uh, it's good, but sometimes it's not so good. There's been a lot of research. We have also thesis, for example, for Squeak, uh, made by Francisco Garau, and many tools in the small talk, like Roll Typer is one that is based on type inference. So, what is generic in live typing? So, the idea of using uh, uh, live typing uh, combined with type inference is to accelerate uh, the algorithm, the type inference algorithm, and to stop the recursion. You know, the problem with type inference is how deep you go into messages, implementers, and senders, and so on. But when you have type information, you stop earlier. So you, you, you cut the branch, the, the, the tree, uh, you know, faster. So let's go to real examples now. Um, yeah. So this is uh, an example where uh, we have an array one element, we are not putting anything on that array. So if you look at the type, it's an array of I don't know what, okay? Because nothing in is in that array. And if we look, uh, if we look for the re type, return type of first, it will say I don't know. It cannot deduce the type because we didn't put anything on the array. 
Here we have an implementation where we put a string in the first uh, position of the array. So now if we look at the type of array, of this array of string, okay? And deduce that because we are putting uh, the string at the first element. So now if we look at first, well, I don't know why, it's, yeah, I know why, but uh, if we look at first, it says it is a string. So if we want to use the auto-completion here, we will get the messages that a string returns. Uh, uh, no, how to answer, sorry. And the same here. If you want to know the return type of add, it will say string. So same thing for the auto-completion. We will see, uh, I don't know, substrings and so on, the messages that the string knows how to answer. So here we already using type inference to get the type of the elements that for this particular array we are uh, using. Um, <clears throat> cool, isn't it? <laughs> um, here is another example. We are putting different types of elements of objects in the array. So in this case, the array is going to be of type uh, array of number because we put a small integer and we put a small float. Okay, so here, if we look at the first, it won't say small integer, even though we know that the first element, we as programmer know that the first element is small integer, but the, you know, the algorithm doesn't know this could be uh, everywhere, you know, in, in another method, but the type of first is going to be number, the same thing for second, okay? So if we go to the auto completion, we will see the common messages that are implemented in into the small integer and small float, but also some messages only on small integer or some messages only on small float, okay? The ones that are in blue are the ones that are implemented only in one type. <clears throat> um, here again, different types, but in this case there are no common superclass between small integer or string, but object or proto-object, so we decided to use um, any as a, as a super type, okay? And uh, again, uh, first, oh, and this is an interesting thing. Uh, the type inference shows us here that the type could be small integer or a string. But once you get the first element and you assign that to a variable, live typing will collect the type of that assignment and will tell you, well, but first is a string. You have more, um, you know, um, complete information, have more information because we, we assign the result of that message to this variable. The same thing here, second, is going to say small integer instead of any. Cool. Um, so what happens if we have a collection assigned with a, an array and a collection that we assign an ordered collection? So what's the type? In this case, it's going to be a sequential collection of string because it's used as an array of string as an ordered collection of string. Okay. Um, what about this? Uh, Mm, with different types. Well, in this case, we have a collection, an array of string, an ordered collection with an integer. So the collection is going to be sequential collection of any, okay, because the types could be small integer or string. Yeah, because here we're assigning an array, but we're putting a string to that array, and here an ordered collection, but we're putting a small integer to it. So the type for first is going to be small integer or a string. Um, but there are some interesting things. For example, here, array doesn't know, doesn't answer add. So if we look at the type, well, it's not big enough, but it's co a sequential collection of small integer or a string, but it knows that the array is only of a string because add is not, you know, uh, array doesn't know how to answer add. So we know that 
an array cannot have a small integer. So that's why we're showing that array is only for strings, okay? So that's part of type inference algorithm. We check those kind of things, and we, and we can check that because of uh, live typing. Uh, well, collection of collections, we have an array of strings and an order collection with an array of strings. So if we look at the type, it's an order collection of an array of string. So if we ask for the first element, it will return an array of a string. And if we ask for the first element, it will return an a string. Um, okay, um, so what should be the type of array on this case? We are creating an array, and then we're sending a message, put a string in, that that message, send the message, put string in two, that sends the message, put in string three, that sends the message, put in string four, okay? And finally, here we see a collection, the collection, uh, you know, somebody would put a string in that collection. So the type of array is an array of strings. So we can see how type inference algorithm works. Uh -huh. uh, the interesting thing is that we can infer the type in this case of, uh, of the array, the generic type for the array, but also we can infer the type of the, of the uh, parameter on of the method put in. So here we have, we send the message put in with an array, and we're sending the message put in with a collection, with an order collection, okay? So the implementation is an object and a collection. So if what's the type of the parameter a collection? So we look for the senders and we check the type and the parameter, uh, the type of that parameter is going to be a sequential collection of small integer that could be an array of small integer or an order collection of small integer. So it deduce the type of the parameter based on the senders of that message. And here, well, this is just to show. Uh, let's see the implementation of this one. It returns the parameter. Okay. So. Again, if you look at the return type, it's going to be sequential collection of small integer or string. But if you look at the type of return collection, it's going to be order collection of small integer or string. Because, you know, he doesn't know exactly what you put. We, we, we put, uh, you know, here a small integer, here a string. So the generic type for the parameter is... Um, small integer or a string. Small integer or a string, that's the generic type of the parameter. Even though he exactly knows in this case that this is an order collection. So those are the tricky things. Here we have a, a bag with and a small integer and a float, and we are creating an order collection and adding uh, yeah, I think I made a mistake here. It should be order collection with all bag. Uh, what I want to show here is that it deduces the type of the uh, the generic type based on the generic type of the collection that you are adding all the elements from also okay and i will have some uh, also implementation is not completely finished for uh, collections with more than than generic type like a dictionary here we have a dictionary where the key is a string and the value is a small integer. So the type is going to be dictionary of a string and small integer. So if you look for the um, type of the value, 
is going to tell you small integer. If you look for the type of the key, it's going to tell you string, but it doesn't work so well because, for example, here, key at value one, you know, the type should be, uh, well, key at value, um, key at value, yeah, key at value is going to be a string. Uh, oh, yeah, this example is not correct. So let's say like this. You you could expect to be uh, you know a string or float, but you know we, that doesn't it's not implemented, and also it's not working when you ask for the keys or the values. We have to work a little bit more on there. Um, and of course, it, it supports collection of collections. So here we have a collection where we add. Uh, a small integer, and then we add the same collection to it. So this is a weird example for type inference. And the type is uh, order collection of anything or small integer. Um, so those are the examples I want to show you. Um, for this to work, there are some things that you have to implement. Generic um, um, no, not this one. Okay. Um, sorry. And this is where you uh, define how the uh, you configure how the uh, type inference is going to work and with messages and from what parameters and so on that's something that is not done automatically okay so you as a programmer have to uh, explicitly uh, define and configure the places where uh, or the messages that you need to uh, infer types from but we are looking for ways to make it more automatically. Okay, uh, there's a future work, um, like uh, automatically detect classes with generic types. We have some ideas. Uh, you know, it's easy to know when you need a generic type because the type of uh, of, sub, of a parameter of or as a return type is any. You know, the the array of types that live typing collects is full and there is no way to uh, infer a generic type so if we look for uh, I don't know um, here maybe session at put okay so here if we look uh, okay and at all uh, okay what is it at put Mm -hmm. Which one? Let's see this. Ah, sorry. Too nervous. Okay. Uh, put here. Yeah. So, uh, for example, here, the type of object is, you know, could be anything. So we can deduce that, you know, that parameter should be a generic one. Uh, those are the things that we're thinking about. We have a better support for annotating types. It's not nice how we do it right now. And some improvement in the algorithm. We're also thinking about using type inference for the blocks, but we are thinking about it. And that's all. So thank you, Adrian. That's his work, and thank you. I wanted to ask if uh, you've been talking with people from other Smalltalk dialects to port this because uh, live typing keeps getting better year after year. And every time you show it, I say, why don't we have this in the other Smalltalks? Well, uh, how's that going? Yeah, we talk a little bit with the, with the guys in the Faro, with Stevan and Gize. And now I have a guy doing his thesis that wants to port live typing to Faro. But the, the, 
the thing is we, we need resources, not resources, we need people. <laughs> blood, we need like people Gilad to do it. Say, what? Uh, Gilad Bracha would say we need blood, more blood. Yeah. Be, uh, okay. <laughs> and we also talk with the Seth, uh, you know, and things in the, for instantiation, but not that much. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's a matter of uh, people, I think. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I think they have their own idea also, yeah. Uh, no, we, we I, I really love the, the live typing stuff. We always look at it from, you know, specific to our customer sets, one of the enterprise. If we drop 5% in performance, we hear about it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I guess the question in that is... Uh, What's the profile uh, or what's the impact on things like uh, memory uh, usage or your implementation down at the VM level? Maybe you can, I think I know some of it, but I think maybe others would benefit. Yeah, I don't, I don't remember exactly. Uh, I think it was a 20% impact on performance. But the thing is, when you are developing, you don't notice that. Uh, so the idea is you should use live typing when developing, but then on production, just put the, the normal VM without live typing. You don't need the VM on production to collect, to collect the types. Or maybe you want to do that if you don't have test for, to, to get information from the running system and retrofit that to the development environment. But you would do that for you know a couple of minutes or whatever and then go back to the real VM again. Uh, regarding um, regarding memory, well, yeah, I don't remember. I have to look at a presentation I gave a couple of years ago. Um, but it's, the impact was nothing compared to what we have right now as uh, memory possibilities with the machines we have. So it's pretty useful, I think. It looks like it's moved forward quite a bit since I think you gave, I yes. saw this at least a couple of years ago. Yeah. Maybe more. Yeah, yeah and, those and ideas it's are... uh, more integrated also with the uh, refactoring tools and so for example if you want to refactor let's say uh i don't know um i have to look an example here uh if you want to i always use the same example i think um yeah this one this message is implemented on tic-tac-toe and on tic-tac-toe state but if you want to rename only the, you know, if, if you look for implementers, yeah, that's it. It will show you five implementers. But if you look for local implementers or actual implementers, sorry, it will only show you one. This is the one of the tic tac So if you want to rename only this message, uh, and you look, let's look for senders too. We look for senders. There are going to be eight for all the senders of that message. But if we look for... Uh, um, actual senders, it will only show you seven. Those are the actual senders for of this message that will evaluate this method. So now if we do a rename, uh, I don't know, like that, and we use the actual scope, so the actual senders and actual implementers, it will only rename this message, not the message of the state hierarchy and not the senders of the state hierarchy. So that's the most important thing of light typing uh, with refactoring is that you can look for the real implementers and senders. So you reduce the the um, scope of uh, you know of implementers and senders. Yeah, yeah, that's the most important thing. You say that if you don't have tests, or well, let's say you have a very low coverage. Can you somehow snapshot the live typing data and just transfer it to other image? Yeah, I mean, I haven't done any tool for that, but they're all objects, arrays of arrays of information. So you just have to write a tool and yeah. dump it, dump that and load it in another image. Yeah, cool. Yeah, there's nothing, uh, everything, all the information that the VM generates is readable from the image. That's, that was the whole idea at the beginning. What does the VM need to support uh, in order to have live typing? Uh, we, you have to change some uh, primitives and some bytecodes. 
that, uh, for example, uh, one of them is the assignment by code, the one that assigns to an instance variable or to a local variable the method activation to get the parameters for, for the, uh, sorry, to get the type for the parameters and the return by code to get the type for the return method. Um, but it's pretty simple. It's, it's not too many places. It's a few primitives, a few um, bytecodes, and oh, we have it running with the GPM now. Uh, that we showed that last year. It's not on the stack VM. It's running on the GPM. Uh, so it's cool. The example you show us, they don't have parameters. How does it work with method with parameters? Uh, what example? The one I show with the... Uh, the test example. The test example? They don't have parameters? Um, do you remember which one? The, I mean, all the tests you show us, they don't have parameters. Oh, yeah, the, this test. Don't so have, how does it work? Uh, oh, type this, is, this is a, 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 a test case. That's why I'm, I'm using SUnit to run the test. Is, is that what does it does it work with methods with the one or two three parameters? And can, can live typing deduce the can make the inference on the type? Yes, 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 it does. Uh, let's see. Um, for example, here uh, I let's see the senders of these, and the senders are here. We're using uh, a, a small integer. For for an object, uh, so if we get if we go here, it will tell you the type of an object is a small integer, okay. And in this case, this is a collection, so it's not going to show us only that this is a collection, but a collection of blah 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 the generic type. So that's the part of the type inference that deduces the generic type for that parameter that is a collection. Um, in that example that you were showing, where uh, if you look at the parameter that's called a collection, there, um, we saw, yeah, go to that method and another put in, yeah, and see the type of a collection, yeah. So my question is, how um, when you have more than one type, previously you um, did use the smaller super type. Right, yeah. that conform to all of that. Yeah. How do you combine, for example, if you have array of of something combined with order collection uh, of something? How do you combine the like ar type arguments? Yeah, that's the I type aliasing of the generic types. So if you have, uh, let's say, here uh, an array, well, in this case, both things, but uh, um, the idea is that. Um, we um, yeah we uh, we take the generic types of one collection and we union that we do a union with the generic type of the other collection. Yeah, and it's not type aliasing; it's a union. Okay, um, so that's why here is the union of the two places we're using this message. We're sending this message. Is here is uh, a string, and here we're putting uh, a small integer. If we change this, let's put another string. Um, and now if we look for the type of this collection, well, I don't know why. <laughs> Is this the one I, I changed it? Uh, yeah. It's an array. Is Maybe I have to change it. Well, I don't know why it's saying a small integer and a string. Uh, maybe the, the example is not correct. But it, it, if it's only, it should be only uh, a string. But I don't know why it's saying that, okay? Um, but yeah, what we do is we take the generic type of one collection, the generic type of another one, and we do the union. And that's what we show. Yeah, no, I don't know. Uh, let's do that, but... Uh, I don't know. 
I have a quick question yes. meanwhile. So now you have like hierarchy senders, like global senders. Uh, there, there it is. Yeah, I, I don't know. Sorry, Esteban. Yep. Yeah, now it's working. Maybe I had to clean the uh, type information. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, Steven. I was I was going to say now you have like like the local senders or hierarchy senders. Yeah. Like the global senders, and you can actually I guess you have that to search for the actual senders. Yes. Good. Yeah. That's yeah, good. yeah. You you can look for actual senders, actual implementers, and actual local impl actual local implementers that are only in the hierarchy. That's pretty cool. So as a naive user of quiz, uh, whenever I see the word actual, yeah, it it refers to that it uses live typing to yeah use? that's right oh, okay yeah we didn't know how to call it uh, you know and with uh, Juan I don't remember why we decided actual <laughs> it makes sense it makes sense yeah but uh, yeah so actual senders actual implementers are part of live typing okay so every time you see actual sender actual implementers or in a refactoring um, Uh, you know when when they ask you for a scope like here is because it's using live typing the difference between actual scope and actual possible scope is because sometimes there's no type information or there we showed that uh, a, a long time ago but for example you can have a a value and an object that receives a message and the type of that object is let's say again small integer and a string so there's no common super type but object uh, but you want to rename a message that is only implemented on a small integer so if you use actual sender and implementers it will tell you that there is a type error in that collaboration because that message is not being answered by a string but by a small integer So that's why you have the actual and possible scope to take care of those places where the type information, you know, is not complete or, or not good enough. And there you, you have to go and select by hand if you want to do the refactoring or not for those collaborations. And when when you see live typing, at, at, suppose you, are already, you have already developed uh, everything you need to develop No, no, I have a lot of things. So you, if you want to do a thesis, just let me know. We have a lot of things to do. Do you see the other, uh, to remove the, actuals, uh, the, the actual versions of these uh, menus and replacing the, the others? Oh, no, no, I don't think we're going to do that. Uh, we still want to keep... Even in the best case scenario? Well, we should talk with Juan. I don't know. I'm not sure it's a good idea. Um... Yeah, I know. I don't know. <laughs>